Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our first breakout session of the 23rd Annual Family Cafe. Now, let's please give a warm welcome to our first speaker, B uh, Chief of the Bureau of Exceptional Student Education, Victoria Gutierrez. Hi there. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here today and for your commitment to our students with disabilities here in the state of Florida. My name is Victoria Gatanis. I am the relatively new Bureau Chief of the Bureau of Exceptional Student Education. My first day as Bureau Chief was December 1st of 2020, but I'm really happy to serve in that role. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of things today. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and my own story. Uh, I think we all have a, a separate path and journey uh, in the disability world, and I want to share a little bit of mine with you. I'm going to provide some updates relative to the department's mission and its vision for all students, including students with disabilities, uh, a little bit of ESE updates and data, which is one of my most favorite things in the world, and then hopefully highlight some resources that I think will be especially useful for parents of students with disabilities. So as I said before, my name is Victoria Gatanis. Uh, I started out my life in education as a regular education teacher. And then I had twins who were micro preemies who were born at uh, 26 weeks. And that comes in, one of them is, is, is visually impaired. And that began my journey in the world of disabilities. So I, like I think we do as parents of students with disabilities, we start to learn about how we can support our children. And that led me to becoming a teacher of students with, I moved from teaching regular ed to teaching students with disabilities. And, and that journey continued until I, I spent the bulk of my work in the classroom with students until I moved to the department and started to lead in that area in a, ver in a variety of roles. So. Um, our journey as parents of students with disabilities, I think we come at it from different ways, but I think there are some common areas. Um, and I'm happy to be able to serve in this role and to provide support to you. And I applaud your efforts to be here and learn more and connect more to provide the supports for the students and, and your own students and children with disabilities. So that's me. Let's talk a little bit about the department. The first thing that I wanted to share is one of the first things that happened when I became Bureau Chief is we had a realignment and some change in the department. And so we separated. We used to be the Bureau of Exceptional Education and Student Services, so B-E-E-S-S. -S. And shortly after I started, the Bureau split. So we became the Bureau of Exceptional Student Education and the Bureau of Student Support Services. So we're two bureaus where there once was one. And um, we still work very closely together. Andrew Weatherall leads the Bureau of Student Support Services. Uh, but we can focus more and, and make sure that our mission is focused on students with um, special needs. And that's one of the reasons why we split the bureaus. So there are other bureaus that have split. You can see we have the Bureau of Family and Support Services. They all are supposed to realign to the department's efforts to refocus and support students um, in specialized ways. So that was some news I wanted to share about that. Let's see if I can do. And the next thing I wanted to do was review the department's mission. Uh, and this was news to me when I came to the department. As a parent, as a teacher, I didn't realize that the mission of the Department of Education here in Florida is set by the legislators, set by, by Florida law. And, and it's for all students and includes our students with disabilities. So our mission, um, which is set forth in statute, and then the vision, which is interpreted by the commissioner, is that we make sure that all students have that seamless, efficient system of education that allows them to expand their knowledge and skills um, and have learning opportunities that are research-based and valued by the community and families. And the, um, the commissioner interprets that to be that we have that efficient, world-class education system that engages and prepares all students to be globally competitive. And we used to call it college, career, and life ready. Um, and I think that still maintains our focus. 
So our goals, which are aligned to our mission, that's how we measure what we're going to do and what we're, what we're focusing on and how we're doing in terms of the mission. And that's, OK, how are our students doing in terms of achievement? Uh, how are they doing in terms of that seamless articulation? Um, are we doing what we need to be doing in terms of developing that skilled workforce and providing opportunities for all students? And how are we doing in terms of providing quality and efficient services? So those are also outlined in statute, and those are how we measure how we're doing with the mission. This is one of my favorite slides. Senior Commissioner, um, sorry, Senior, uh, Senior Deputy Commissioner Hall presented this at the January State Board. And it talks about how our values kind of inform as, a, as an organization, inform our priorities, and help improve outcomes. And it starts with the, uh, the number one thing is that uh, in the Department of Education and every district, we believe all children can learn. That is a foundational value that should drive all of the work that we're doing with students. Um, that we are not guessing, uh, that we're using data and documentation and informing what we do based on real information and facts. That it's forensically supported, in, in other words. That we are focused on closing those achievement gaps. And that we are student and family centered. So if we're doing all of those things right, uh, then it should drive our priorities and drive our outcomes with our students. And I want to share a little bit later how well Florida's doing. I'm very, I'm very proud to be a part of a state that values data, that values facts, that also has tremendous outcomes compared to other states uh, for students with disabilities. So you have tremendous opportunity here, and I want to share that news with you guys. Um, one thing I wanted to mention kind of before I move forward to department updates was this is a, a, our theory of action in the Bureau. It's been our theory of action since before I was here, I and mean, it's just updated a little bit, but it kind of uh, provides a framework for understanding how the department supports districts, how the district supports schools, and how schools support your students so that they remain engaged and uh, in, in the educational system, get the education they need, and have positive uh, post-school outcomes, which is our ultimate goal. All right, let's get into some updates then. So if you haven't had a chance to visit, the US Department of Education has this really cool website called Fast Facts. Um, and I'm a numbers person, I really like data, and this gives us a snapshot of where we are in terms of students with disabilities. So, of course, students with disabilities, it's a big world. You have students with disabilities who are 504 eligible, and then you have students with disabilities who are eligible via the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA Part B. Um, and both of those together make up the big world of students with disabilities. So this fast fact takes those students who are eligible under Part B and tells us the story of what that looks like. And what we know is that since 2012, we have increased almost, half, and in terms of numbers, half a million more students with disabilities since 2012. So our numbers are increasing. Um, that's about 12% increase. What does that mean in terms of what, the, or what does that look like in Florida? So it's, we mirror that, that we're mirroring the nation and that we, uh, the percentage of students who are identified as eligible, uh, as an IDEA Part B eligible student with disability has increased. We're about 14.4%. We're on the upswing. So we have more students in Florida who are identified. That, that, is, that number doesn't even count students who have 504s. Here's another way to look at it. So the, the big colored, looks like a vase. That's the US in terms of numbers of students with disabilities by category or by, by eligibility area. And then the other side is Florida. And so you can see we mirror the nation in a lot of ways. This is another way to look at that, but just takes out the Florida. So just like the nation, our largest population of students with disabilities are students identified as uh, having a specific learning disability or SLD. 
which can sometimes include dyslexia, dysgraphia, those are examples of SLD. That's our, that's our largest population of students with disabilities. And then the second largest, of course, is our students identified with a speech or language impairment. Now there's a little tiny red sliver on this particular graph that says other. And those are our low incidence disabilities. That's about 2.5% of the 14.4 or 400,000 uh, students who are all of our students with disabilities. So if you take that 2.5% and you take a look at it and you expand it and take a look at our low incidence, you'll see that the largest population of our low incidence students are the students who are identified as deaf or hard of hearing closely followed by uh, students who are orthopedically impaired. That's unusual, we have a higher number of orthopedic impaired students in Florida than is typical for the nation. That's just an interesting fact. All right, another one of my favorite topics. I love numbers and I really like talking about inclusion too, if you know um, my story. And so we're gonna talk about what the federal law says about inclusion for students with disabilities, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about what Florida says. Florida is a little unusual in terms of what other states do, in that it has a lot of state-specific laws that are specific to students with disabilities. That's unusual for a state, and I think it's part and parcel to the focus that Florida has on supporting students and families with disabilities. So I'm gonna just do these three bullets. So the story in terms of what IDEA or the federal law says about students with disabilities is that they should be, as much as possible, included with their non-disabled peers. Um, and that what that means is, you know, regular, edu regular education classrooms are not just our educational or academic classrooms, it's PE, it's a special area, it's uh, lunchroom, it's playground time. Those are all areas that should be as inclusive as possible. And that we only remove students from that regular education placement when we've got the data and the documentation that says it's not working, the nature or severity of the disability for this student is making this not a successful placement. And so once we have all that data that says, okay, this is not working, we've tried all of these supports and, and, and structures, that's when we start thinking about other placements. Florida goes further in its laws to define and highlight the importance of inclusion of students with disabilities, um, and also requires districts to have a plan for how they're going to improve their inclusion for students with disabilities. So we have federal law, we have state law, and I think it's important also to draw it back to, well, why? Why this push for inclusion? Before I do that, I'm gonna compare us to what's called the seven pack. So the seven largest states um, in the United States, it, we uh, like California, Illinois, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, and then us. We're the third largest in terms of population, but we belong, when we group data, we often are included as part of that seven pack of states. And so Florida has the highest rate of inclusion for students with disabilities among the seven largest states in the nation. And that's due in large part because of how informed our parents are, how um, important it is, how it's stressed in state law, and, and the support and training we provide to our districts and schools. So if you look back 30 years ago, it was about a coin toss. And if you look back even further, back maybe to the 60s, you know, students with disabilities weren't at all included. And then maybe 30 years ago, it was a coin toss, flip, 50-50 chance your child was gonna have the opportunity to participate with non-disabled peers. Um, currently, it's almost 78% uh, of students with disabilities in Florida are, are fully included with their non-disabled peers or in regular education placements, 80% or more of the time. And that's tremendous, tremendous movement, part of Florida's success story and something to be proud of. 
That doesn't mean that there's not work to do. There's some more work to do. And this breaks down data by a specific disability category. So you'll see here that, that dark blue line. If you have a specific learning disability, you're more likely to be in a regular education or uh, setting. You are less likely to be in a regular education setting if you have, or if you've identified with an intellectual disability. So that's just something to, it's a think about, I think, when we look at the data, something to think about. There are other disability categories in there as well, like ASD, which is Autism Spectrum Disorder, EBD, Emotional Behavioral Disability, OHI, Other Health Impaired. It gives us um, some numbers that we can think about and, and um, reflect on to make other policy decisions. So this is the first of a couple slides on a recent study conducted um, at Stanford University at the behest of the California Department of Education. And I have some friends there who were talking to me about they have really poor outcomes for students with disabilities. They have really poor inclusion rates. And they are really um, putting together some, some think tanks and some groups and gathering data to try to see how they, as a state, because they are the second most populous state, how they can improve their outcomes with students with disabilities. And who did they look to? they looked to Florida. Because Florida has the highest rate of inclusion of students with disabilities, they wanted to see um, how that was reflected in performance. And so they looked at this test called the NAEP test, which is the, um, it's N-A-E-P, it's a national test. It tests select groups of students all over the country in reading and in math, and it kind of gives us a picture of how they're doing. So when you look at Florida's performance for students with disabilities on the SNAPE score, you'll see we're, we're among, our students with disabilities perform among the best in the nation in this test, and this is the fourth grade results. We also have the highest rate of inclusion. And so California compared our inclusion rates and our NAEP scores for fourth grade reading to their inclusion rates and their NAEP scores, and they said, okay, we've got some, and then there's the, the dark blue line is the national average. So Florida's better than the national average in terms of inclusion. We perform better than the national average and among the best in the nation for how our students perform on this test of reading in the fourth grade. Um, and, and so all those three things together said, okay, California has asked us, what, how, how are you doing this and how can we better support our students like Florida does. This is also reflected in our eighth grade scores. So not only do our fourth grade students with disabilities perform among the best in the nation, our eighth grade students do too. That's not something that happens alone. It's not something that the State Department does alone. It's not something that teachers do alone. It's something because we know that, that, that we have uh, families who are passionate and involved and, and, and parents like you who are here today to learn more about how you can support your students. And that trifecta, I think, leads to improvement in scores like this that, that elevates Florida to among the best in the nation in terms of outcomes for students with disabilities. So we talk not just about how well they're doing on, on, on you know, in terms of educational and academic performance. You know, at the end of the day, I went to a commencement earlier this week. Uh, it's about um, what happens next. And I think that's something, as my own student with a disability got older, that's uh, something that I started to think about more and more, what happens next. So it starts with graduation. They call graduation ceremonies commencements because it's the beginning of that next step. Um, and in terms of how Florida's doing, um, among all of the seven most populous, the seven PAC, the seven most populous states in the nation, we are um, very close. We have been uh, competing with Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is number one in terms of graduation uh, standard diploma for students with disabilities. We've, we've been a percentage point or two behind them for the last three years. I hope in the next couple of years we can, can surpass them in this. Um, but. Either way, we are among the top uh, in the nation for getting our students uh, graduated with that standard diploma. And of course, you can see that about 20 years ago, you had a 30% likelihood that your student with a disability would graduate with a standard diploma. 
today it's almost 89%, 88%. And for all students, it's at 90%. So we're closing that gap. And again, reflective of the hard work of our families, our teachers, our districts, um, and all those who work for, our, for and with our students with disabilities. So we can't look at graduation without looking at dropout, right? How well are we at, uh, at keeping our students there, preventing them from dropping out, making sure that they have access to education and support and training? And again, this number to tell the clear story, Florida has the lowest dropout rate of the seven largest states in the nation. We are at 9%. If you are in California, that's about 15% of our students with disabilities in California drop out, as opposed to the nine-ish percent here in Florida. And of course, you know, we were where Ohio was. Ohio is about 20%. We were there a few years ago. Um, but it is the hard work and efforts of our families and teachers have led us to being the lowest dropout rate for students with disabilities at that 9.4%. Another thing that we do and we measure, because it's not just about graduation, right? It's how well they're doing when they leave us. Are they in college? Are they competitively employed? Are our students um, in continuing education or vocational training, what happens when they leave us? Because that's a measure of our success. Florida is very unique in that it collects this data, um, and it's a, it's a model for other for other states of how to collect data and use that to improve outcomes. We call it FEPPIP data, Florida Education and Training Placement Information Program data, and it tracks students who leave us two years later. Where are they? How well are they doing? And so when we take that data and we pull out data for students with disabilities, you know, we're doing okay, we're doing, we're, we're improving. Um, the red line, that red bar is how many of our students with disabilities are in college after they leave us or in higher education. The green line is how many are in higher education or are competitively employed. So both those numbers together make that green bar. And then the Navy line is how many are employed or doing some kind of continuing education like vocational training or um, some kind of supported training. So we can see, okay, we did some great work uh, moving, moving that needle up. We're, a, we're having a little bit of trouble. It helps us to reflect on how we can better support movement in this area to make sure our, our students have access to more positive uh, post-secondary outcomes, and you can see the gap exists, the gaps there. The green is all students, and the navy is our students with disabilities. So we are um, we're moving forward, but we've got work to do in this area. And I, as one of my goals uh, as bureau chief, is to continue to work closely and reach out to the uh, career and technical education and other bureaus within the department to see what we can do to create a bridge. Uh, to provide more post-secondary opportunities and provide a stronger link as, as specific to our students with disabilities. All right, I have some other ESE updates. I really appreciate you guys hanging with me through all of these numbers. I know many people don't enjoy them as much as I do. So many of you know we're in transition. We are, we are moving from our Florida standards to the best standards. This is that timeline that's available and I think highly publicized on both our Twitter account and on our department webpage. It talks about that transition plan for moving towards our new standards, our best standards. And also, we have been reminded by the feds that uh, federal law, uh, ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act, that was a reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, tells us that alternate assessments are only appropriate for students with the most significant cognitive disabilities. And they have reminded us that, we, that the state we must help and support districts and IEP teams to make sure that they are documenting and, use, and carefully considering students to ensure um, and that they have most that they are among students with the most significant cognitive disabilities in order to, to, to participate in those alternate assessments. And this, I think, is a checklist that many of you may be familiar with. Things that we think about when we're placing students on alternate assessments. Um, 
uh, and a kind of a guided question, you know, if it's, does the student have a cognitive disability? If so, is it a significant cognitive disability? If so, is it a most significant cognitive disability? And that's when we begin the consideration for removal from standards instruction to alternate standards because it comes with some real impacts on their post-secondary life um, and restrictions. Uh, when we talk with districts about what compliance looks like, one thing we've reminded districts a lot, and I know many of you are probably familiar with a, a recent court case that, um, uh, for a specific district that had a student that was inappropriately placed on access points. Students who are identified as SLD, specific learning disability, uh, federal and state law says that those students cannot have had a learning problem that's a result of intellectual factors, so they are prohibited. If you have SLD, you can't take the alternate assessment. You have to take the general ass uh, assessment. And IEP teams can consider, you know, and go back and say, okay, did we identify this student in the right eligibility area? But if they're identified with SLD, they are prohibited from taking an alternate assessment. Um, talks about how our children grow and change so fast, um, and the feds recognize that. They, you know, they, are, they are people who make these laws, and they say, okay, that means that we need to, if we notice there's a change, review and revise, and that requirement is in federal law. So if we notice a change in a student, we've gotta come back to the table as an IEP team and say, what do we, can we do better? Are we still supporting this student correctly? Um, and so we remind districts that that's a, that's a requirement. And so if you know there's a change, even if you just met, you gotta come back to the table and say, let's check, check and make sure we've got all the supports we need here for this student. Um, also, alternate assessments require permission or documented attempts at, per, at parental permission. So that's another compliance thing that we remind districts of when we're talking about assessments on alternate standards. Another thing that we've been focused on is dispute resolution. So we're required to take data on this as a state. Uh, the, we take data from, it's July 1 to June 30th, it's fiscal year data, we submit it to the feds, it's published um, and made public, but we also use it at the state level to inform our technical assistance with districts because we know that if we can, the earlier that disputes can get resolved, the earlier in the process they can get resolved, the more we can preserve relationships, and the more those relationships can be preserved, the better those outcomes for our students with disabilities. So that we track this data, and we're actually beginning some work with districts to help improve that. Overall, as a state, we're pretty, we're not as bad as like, okay, we're on the, the, the low to middle in terms of dispute resolution activity. Um, you'll see states like um, New York or maybe Washington, D.C. at the far end, really high, a uh, lot of dispute resolution activity. So, so if, we're not doing terribly, but of course we can always improve, and continuous improvement is what it's all about. Among that, so about, you know, we, we keep track of our state IDEA complaints, and that's when you have a complaint uh, regarding the services for your students with disabilities, or maybe identification of a student with a disability, or something along those lines. And we keep track of those numbers. We also keep track of the numbers that we find when we investigate um, of areas of noncompliance. So if we find some noncompliance where they didn't do something that they were supposed to do, we keep track of that. And we've noticed that those numbers have been a little bit on the increase, which has um, kind of informed some of our changes and adaptations and reach out and technical assistance. Because what we'd like is for those numbers not to be increasing. <laughs> What we'd like also is to see more alternate resolution. Um, the federal law and state law provides for um, a, an array of alternate dispute resolution. One of these is mediation. And that's when parents and districts get together with a mediator, a neutral third party, and they, and they try to come to an agreement. Um, in Florida, we use court-certified mediators. They're highly trained. 
And we've been doing a really good job, I think, of increasing our agreement rate. So if we can get them to come to mediation, there's about an 80% likelihood that they'll come to some kind of an agreement. And those agreements are confidential. So um, the using of alternate resolutions like mediation, um, and I'll talk a little bit later about facilitation uh, or state facilitated IEPs, is, is a really good way to try to preserve those relationships so that uh, districts and parents can get back to focusing on what really matters, which are, you know, that, that's the student, the outcomes for that student. This is just some more recent updated data about mediation. And this data talks to us about due process. So due process is a federal and state right for, for families of students with disabilities. It's one of the most contentious ways to try to solve a dispute. So when you ask for a hearing, and, um, and, go, and, and a hearing you will go before an administrative law judge uh, from the Division of Administrative Hearing, or DOA, and the district will present their case, and the parent will present their case, and the judge will make a, a, a decision. It's very narrow in scope. There's not a lot of, you know, it's not as wide as maybe the things that we can consider in other options like mediation. Um, but very few of these cases actually end up being heard by an administrative law judge, and that's what the data tells us. Most of them either get withdrawn or dismissed, and for those of them that get heard by an administrative law judge, very few of them actually have any ordered actions associated with them. So there are few, very few um, findings of noncompliance which emerge through that. The judge says, okay, district, you've got to do that. That's an ordered action. And that, doesn't happen very often as a result of the due process, uh, at least historically, okay, so that's an important consideration. So also wanted to share our dispute resolution page. We'll be updating, we'll be doing some updates in the near future, but this is a really good resource uh, for you guys in case, because we know disputes happen. We care, when you care deeply about something, you're, you're more likely to disagree because you care about it. And, and what's more important than the education and future of our children? So, so disagreements will happen. And when those happen, it's important to know what your options are. We offer, um, which is not a requirement of state law, we offer state facilitated IEP. Uh, where that neutral third party, if you're starting to have disagreements and maybe you feel like it would be more helpful to have a state facilitator, we offer that option as the state. We, pay, we provide and support uh, both financially and through training that for districts. And of course, people have to agree. If districts and parents agree, we'll send a state facilitator in there. And we've been doing it virtually and in person as well, but that's a good option, mediation. And you can find out all that information in some really good articles. Um, from our National Technical Assistance Centers, those are available at that dispute resolution page on the department's webpage. It's a good resource. I hope you use it. There are other resources, too, I'd like to highlight and share, just because I found them valuable as a parent myself, and I know other parents have as well. And sometimes it's, it's hard in the sea of information that we live in to kind of pinpoint what's good, accurate information you can use and what's noise, what may be leading you in the wrong direction. So here's some good highlight ones that I found useful. One of the things that we support both financially um, and, and through outreach is the provision for every parent of a student with a disability in the state of Florida is access to this thing called Special Ed Connections. It's an LRP thing. There's a link on this website, uh, webs on this slideshow, sorry, um, to your fiddlers, your local fiddlers, which I'll talk a little bit about more later, but that'll help you get access if you don't already have access to this. And there are so many articles, checklists, um, information about laws, information about what other states are doing, uh, so much information available here. Uh, and, and that I think you may find useful as a parent of a student with disability. So this is a good resource. I hope you use it. Um, and here's a way to, there's a link to help you have access to it if you don't already. Another really good resource that I really found helpful and useful, it comes from another National Technical Assistance Center funded by USDOE. Uh, the Technical Assistance Center goes by the acronym CADRE 
which is the Center for Appropriate Dispute Resolution in Special Education. And they have this really cool uh, webinar series called Working Together Series. And it's little short videos, kind of examples, some articles too. And it's really designed for IEP teams and parents to kind of go through and say, it gives you uh, dispute resolution skills. So it has a lot of skills that we use and provide in training to our state facilitators and mediators. And it's really good to have when you're emotional and, and, and really invested in a problem and you're there in a meeting, it's good to have a skill set to fall back on. And these videos are really good at providing some of real life examples of how to use those skills and what those skills look like. It's a good reminder. Um, it's also a good reminder if you're experiencing some difficulties with IEP teams to share it out with your school uh, to, so that they can maybe utilize it as well and provide those skills to teachers who, who may not have had access before. So maybe if parents share it and we share it, we can all get to the place where we have some really good dispute resolution skills and prevent those disputes from happening in the first place, and that's my hope. This one is another one of my favorites. It's uh, Parent Center Hub. It's an OSEP US DOE funded website. Uh, Center for Parent and Information Resources is also another name for it. But it's parent friendly language and it has all kinds of um, information in parent friendly language about all kinds of disabilities. Uh, it has your local, it'll help you find your local parent center information, your, your parent technical assistance centers or PTAs. Um, and I really, I really use this a lot as a parent and I've used it a lot as a practitioner. So it's really helpful. I like it. I'm sharing it with you guys. This I also wanted to make sure you guys knew about. This is the reading scholarship accounts that are available to all students including students with disabilities who made below a three on the grade three or grade four statewide standardized English language arts assessment. So you can apply for it as a parent. If, you're, if your student didn't do so hot on those assessments, you can apply for the scholarship and it's, uh, it, it'll give you about $500 per eligible student. And you can use this money for tutoring, for after school programs, for summer um, programs to support your student in improving their reading skills. It's a great um, resource. There's a link there that you can apply for it. You will just need their FLEID, which you can get from their school, and then their FSA report that you know shows that they didn't, they maybe struggled a little bit, did a three or did below a three on that English language arts assessment. And um, it's a step up for students grants, but it gives you some extra money, which we all know helps to provide curriculum and support or uh, to your student to help them in the area of reading. So it's just another resource out there. I wanted to make sure you guys knew about it because I know um, not a lot, we don't have a lot of utilization of this scholarship currently and it's, it's available for you guys. So I wanted to share that. So some other resources that I think are important. All school districts have to submit to us their policies for e that are specific to ESE. And they get, once we review them and approve them, they're made public. So if you have a question about, well, what is my school district's policy about independent educational evaluations? I think their evaluation is wrong. I want an independent educational evaluation. What's their policy about it? We got it. It's posted on the public website. They have to talk about it. Um, and so that's a good place to go and, and you can to look that up any information about their ESE policies and procedures that you have questions about. That's the first bullet. Um, if you want to know who to contact at the district, that's that second bullet. Those are, that's often your first best step to getting the answers you need is to go straight to the source. Also added USDOE's IDEA page, which if, if you have a question about what the law says about something, that's a good one too. And then some contact information. So um, one of the things we do as a bureau is we fund projects that support students with disabilities, um, like Family Cafe, like um, Fiddler's Centers, regional Fiddler's Centers. And one of the main goals of our Fiddler's Centers, which is the first bullet there, is to provide support to parents. That's one of their pillars, one of the things they are required and supposed to do. So that link will help you find where your Fiddler's Center is. And they are a really good resource for you guys in terms of if you have questions and you need some more support. 
And if they, if they don't provide the support you need, tell us, because I want to hear about it. There's an email that you can tell me about it. There's also a fillable page on our website. If you want to tell me all about it, it'll, it'll submit that form to us, and we'll get it to a specialist um, who will contact you as soon as they can. Here are some other projects that the Bureau funds to support students with disabilities that I think you, you, know, you might know or might have heard of. Um, Project 10 is a transition pro program. Florida Inclusion Network is here today. They have a booth in the exhibition hall. Uh, I encourage you to reach out to them. Go stop by if you can. They have some good information. Uh, Fiddlers, of course, we talked about already. So I really look forward to continuing in this role and to supporting families like myself and you guys of students with disabilities, uh, to partner with all stakeholders with districts, um, and to move forward collaboratively to help improve our outcomes for our students with disabilities. I appreciate your all's time today. I want to introduce two people that are from the, the, the Bureau here with me. They have cards. If you have questions that you want to ask the Bureau, uh, we've got cards here and at the booth. Um, if you fill them out, we will make sure to get them to the right specialist. We have specialists in disability areas who can help answer questions for you. Um, I have Ms. Chelsea Strickland. She is our lead. Our, uh, she, di she directs all of the monitoring activities for the Bureau. She also is one of our point people for students with intellectual disabilities currently. And then I have Mr. Julian Morera. He is one of our directors in our dispute resolution uh, division within the, the Bureau. And so if you want a card, you, you, wanna, you have a, a question, you want to get the, to the Bureau and to the department, feel free to fill one out. They'll, they'll hand one to you. You can drop it off at the, at the booth or hand it back to them if you'd like. Um, but either way, we're here to help you, um, and we're here to support you. And I appreciate your time today. I can, I can take a few live questions, sure. Oh, the, the, the PowerPoint presentation? I was just wondering where we could get a copy of the PowerPoint, either emailed or a physical, like, paper copy. So um, I can provide it to fam Can I provide it to family? I'll provide it to Family Cafe, and they can. Can you guys post it? Or? Any other questions that I can help with? All right. Isn't it true that most parents who don't have an attorney, because there are very few attorneys that will help in due process, have their due process complaint denied for notices of insufficiency that the school attorneys do, and then the judges dismiss the cases? So, it, so your question is about um, notices of insufficiency. So due process does have very specific requirements, and in order to, for a judge to hear it, it has to meet those requirements. It's called sufficiency. And if it doesn't, then they can dismiss that case. Um, and it, because due process is the most contentious form, uh, and it, it has some certain requirements, we have those requirements. Uh, for a due process request that are they're currently on our website and there's a in parent friendly language that it comes to us from cadre that can be of assistance to you if you're filing a due process but I would highly I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Chelsea to give you to write your question down in a card and we can have our due process expert come reach out to you and provide you some more even detailed more information about that okay I have one more. Sure. As there are very few attorneys in the state of Florida that will represent a parent, Florida has a policy of a person has to become a qualified representative. In the federal law and the state, a parent has a right to have a person of knowledge who's not an attorney. But it is the school attorney and the administrative law judge who decide 
if the parent's choice for a person of knowledge to assist them qualifies to be a qualified representative? How can we get advocates to qualify to be qualified representatives when it is the school attorney and the judge that makes those decisions? So that question is best answered by the Division of Administrative Hearing. Because due process is run by the Division of Administrative Hearing, they I, I, set who's a qualified representative. And we can get you, once you, if you, add, if you have your, car, if you will write your question down on the card, we'll get you to, we'll provide you the contact for the Division of Administrative Hearing who can provide some support in that area. Okay. Since the due process hearing system in the state of Florida is run by the administrative law judges, and they do not follow the procedural safeguards that are provided to parents, but follow Florida civil law and administrative law judge law. Is it possible that we can discuss removing our due process hearing system from the administrative law judges to hearing officers and a two-tier system with a state review officer so that parents will be allowed to go to due process hearing, which they are not allowed to do in this state right now unless they have an attorney. So parents, can, parents are not required to have an attorney to file due process, and they are definitely allowed to attend due process hearings. But um, definitely feel free to write your questions down, and I will take that back for consideration. All right, do we have any more questions? Thank, thank you. Um, you also might want to be aware that disability rights provides parents with attorneys for their children. Thank you so much. That's a good point. Disability rights is a federally funded project, and they do provide uh, free access to free. They have a really great, you would just have to Google Florida Disability Rights. They have a really great website. They do provide free legal um, support to parents of students with disabilities. Thanks for sharing. Oh, thank you. They have, they're also here. They have a booth um, in the exhibit hall if you, if you want. Uh, first, I just want to thank you for everything that you do for our students here in Florida. Um, I do have a question regarding um, a state, um, perhaps if there's a state EPAC. I know from our local, in our local communities and our local counties, there is the ESC Parent Advisory Councils that each um, county has that I'm actively involved with in Flagler County. Mm -hmm. But I was curious if there's anything that is similar to that um, makeup that where parents are able to collaborate with uh, this at the state level? That's a really great and timely question. We have just rebooted our, um, our we, have a, we are rebooting our state advisory council for students with disabilities. Um, if when, Chelsea, if you can get her name and email address, we can send you an application if you would like to be considered. Um, the applications are reviewed at the Bureau and the Commissioner reviews all the applications. He makes the appointments uh, for, for parents and stakeholders who serve. But if you send us your email, if you get your email address to us, we'll make sure you get an application as well. Okay. Hello. Uh, I just want to make a statement. Sure. If the school system would just follow the IDEA. Nobody would ever have to go to a judicial level to get something that their kid needs to learn at school. Just follow the law and not fight with a parent for against the best needs of the student. And then you wouldn't have any, you, the school system or the administration would rather spend more money on lawyers than provide a service that would cost a lot less for that individual child. I definitely hear your frustration. And one of our goals at the department is to help get the conversation back on track. Yep. And so what we try to do, and we can help in some of those situations. Sometimes we can actually uh, liaise between districts 
and ha you know, or have uh, or have conversations with districts, or provide state facilitated IEPs, so that we have that third party there. Um, but I definitely I hear your frustration. We're here to support you. You know, feel free to reach out to the department. We will try to um, bridge that divide and and, and readjust that conversation so that both parents and districts can refocus on what's good for our kids and our students. All right, any other questions that I can help with today? Good afternoon. Um, it sounds like you're doing a great job with inclusion for students with specific learning disabilities, but what are your plans to improve inclusion opportunities for students with intellectual disabilities? That's a really good and also timely question. So, um, so one of the, some of the work, uh, one of the projects that we fund is also called Project Access, um, and one of and they are partnering with our Florida Inclusion Network to provide some more support and training to districts and schools on how students with intellectual disabilities can be included uh, and more included in the general education setting. There's a section, um, not a section. There's a speaking engagement that Miss Chelsea will lead later that we'll talk a little bit about more, more about those efforts, but definitely that's on the way and in the plans. <coughs> Excuse me, I am very dry. All right, any other questions? <laughs> 